Ness, did you hear about the new Alex merch? The fuck y'all talking about? Well, what do you mean the fuck I'm talking about? It's on your t-shirt right now. What? Do you see it? It's on you right now. Do you see that? Whoa. What? Man, you got to... You... Man, what the is that? I have no idea, man. You gotta go get some of that Outlast merch. It's in the description. First link, goodbye. I just want to start off saying, holy shit, we hit 12,000 views on my first Outlast Iceberg video. That might not seem like a lot to some people. However, the amount of fan reception I got was incredible. It surpassed my most viewed video on YouTube, which I made about three years ago. I can't begin to express my gratitude for all the new fans I received. Thank you for all your support, and I just want everyone to know you motivate me to make more extremely high quality videos in the future. It took some time, but I was able to find topics that I missed, places that I did not venture yet, and characters I didn't explore. Not only that, but I've also dug deep into the pages of Reddit to discover conspiracy theories theories that might seem out of this world. I've categorized all the levels of the iceberg, so make sure to look in the description for the timestamps. Make sure to join my community Discord. I've got some incredible people to help me out with this iceberg because of it. If you'd like a shout out for the Outlast 2 iceberg that I'm going to be making, make sure to join and I'll give you credit for any theories you have. A massive thanks to the narrator of this video, Vanessa Brandy. Make sure to check out her YouTube channel. She does random vlogs about her life and what she does in the little town where she lives. If you would like to be a narrator or scriptwriter for any of my future videos, instructions will be provided in the description. Collaborations, on the other hand, will only happen if you message me on Discord. Anyway, without further ado, I give you the Outlast Whistleblower Iceberg. Even though this video analysis is about the short DLC, this is going to be a long video. Grab some popcorn if you think you're going to get hungry. Wayland Park Wayland Park was a former software engineer that worked at Mount Massive Asylum. There's barely any records of his past life, but thanks to Jeremy Blair, we find out Wayland graduated at the University of Berkeley. After further research, it's apparent that Wayland also graduated cum laude. If you don't know what cum laude means, you're not alone. It actually took me quite a while to figure out what this terminology was. However, after a little bit of digging, cum laude is Latin for with honor, and serves as a way to distinguish students with exemplary academic success. Not gonna lie, I didn't know one little phrase could add a lot of context to someone's past life. Anyway, at some point after his graduation, he met his future wife, Lisa Park. It's unknown where they met or how they met, but eventually they had two sons. I couldn't find the names of these two boys, so I'm just going to assume that Red Barrels didn't think this far ahead. If you find any information about these two boys, please leave them in the comment section. Sometime later, Wayland got a job in the field of software consulting. Because of the job that he recently secured, he was required to move from Boulder, Colorado to Leadville, Colorado. As we all know, Leadville, Colorado is where Mount Massive Asylum is located. Funny enough, the only reason why he accepted the job offer was because of his massive student debt that he was trying to pay off. Over time, Waylon developed a deep-seated distrust of the profit-motivated scientists and doctors leading dangerous, irresponsible, and inhumane experiments on their patients. After Wayland realized he had made a huge error in judgment, he decided to expose Murkoff's inhumane experiments to the public. I'm pretty sure Wayland had some help considering what Jeremy Blair said about the borrowed laptop. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out Wayland wasn't the only whistleblower in the facility? Or at least he wasn't the only person that thought Murkoff's experiments were inhumane. Maybe in the future, games will have more concrete evidence that there were more whistleblowers during the corporation's reign. As we know, Wayland escaped Mount Massive and leaked all of his recorded evidence online. We don't know if he will be assassinated by Murkoff or if he will spend the rest of his life in hiding. After Wayland uploads the footage he's captured, he burns down his house and him, his wife, and sons flee their now past house. While searching through the rubble, Pauline Glick and Paul Marion discover a family photo of Wayland, his wife, and their two sons. Wayland and his family's whereabouts are unknown. Jeremy Blair Jeremy Blair was Murkoff's executive vice president of global development. For those who don't know what global development is, it's often linked with human development and international efforts to reduce poverty and inequality and improve health, education, and job opportunities around the world. After hearing that definition, how the hell is Jeremy the vice president of global development? The title sounds like it should be held by an upstanding and kind human being that's driven to help people in their times of need. Jeremy must have one hell of a mask outside of the corporation. Sadly, however, Jeremy's personal life is completely unknown. No mention of his parents, no mention of any potential kids he might have, no outside information in sight. He's also the head of Mount Massive Asylum and Project Wallrider. He oversees everybody working on human-based experiments. That includes all the classified projects that have not been named as of right now. Jeremy was the key individual behind the morphogenic engine experiments. That also means he was the reason why the outbreak of deranged patients happened in the first place. Sometime before
before the entire Mount Massive incident, Pauline Glick, a woman investigating an anonymous HR complaint at Mount Massive, encounters Jeremy Blair, who comes on to her and is subsequently rejected. Later, Blair looks on as Michelle Ha's security clearances are destroyed. It subsequently works with Pauline to combat the potential liabilities posed by female employees' psychosomatic pregnancies. For context, Michelle Haas was a former Murkoff IT specialist who was one of several women at Mount Massive to experience symptoms of false pregnancies. Jeremy's primary purpose was to inform the Murkoff Corporation on the results obtained by the human experimentation. Under his control were the security force granted by Murkoff's higher-ups and a paramilitary division. He utilized these pawns to keep the secrets of the asylum unknown to society, going as far as institutionalizing, torturing, killing, or enrolling at the morphogenic engine program. These severe punishments were, and still are, for anyone who tries to expose Murkoff and their plans to the public. He even blackmails family members of certain people who have tried to expose the corporation. An example of this is when Jeremy sends an email explaining how he will take care of Lisa Park personally. Jeremy Blair is deceased. He was murdered by the wall writer or Miles Upshur, depending on what you want to believe. Off screen, upon discovering Jeremy's dismembered corpse in the aftermath of the Mount Massive Asylum incident, Pauline remarks that he's lost weight. Even though Jeremy was a horrible human being, Pauline doesn't seem phased that he was murdered. This indicates nobody from the corporation is safe or will care if someone from their own organization were to be executed. The heartlessness of this corporation seems boundless. Frank Manera Frank Manera was a part of the Project Wall Rider experiments. His first patient consultation was November 1, 2010, and by August 29, 2012, he had dropped from 228 to 155 pounds. This is a clear indication that he was starved during the experimentation, or he was so mentally damaged he refused to consume food. In his patient report, it was noted that by August 29, 2012, he was lethargic and largely non-responsive, exhibiting interest only in hypnotherapy script pattern 9. I think what they mean by script is the template they followed when inducing these hypnotic sessions. In pattern 9 is one of the many different intervals they used during hypnotherapy. One of the many concerning side effects during these hypnotic experiments on Frank was he started exhibiting cravings to drink human blood from the chest area of men. This is clearly an indication of his cannibalistic behavior before the psychiatric facility was overrun. Another of the side effects he showed was refusal to take baths and other self-care duties. However, if the Murkoff staff needed to induce anesthesia in Frank, he would gladly accept. Before all the experimentation done on Frank Venera, he was previously a stoner. Following the incident at Mount Massive, Murkoff's tactical division were tasked with resecuring the asylum and were given permission to shoot and kill any and all survivors, with the exception of any high-ranking Murkoff employees. I bring this up because there is a strong possibility that Frank was gunned down during the operation. It's not like he had this foresight for strategic planning. But then again, I could be completely wrong. He might have escaped into society, most likely to wreak havoc on any civilians he comes across. Eddie Gluskin Eddie Gluskin has indeed one of the saddest backstories in Outlast's history. Before Eddie was admitted at Mount Massive Asylum, he was frequently sexually assaulted by his father and uncle. Eddie's age was somewhere around 6 to 10 years old. His father and uncle would catalog their horrific crimes toward him by capturing pictures and videos of the abuse. Eddie was at the age where he didn't know what was happening to him was wrong. He just knew it was painful. Eddie's father and uncle were eventually incarcerated at an unknown prison. As a coping mechanism for his traumatically violent upbringing, Eddie would claim he was raised in a Leave it to Beaver home. For those who don't know, Leave it to Beaver was an American television sitcom broadcast between 1957 and 1963 about an inquisitive and often naive boy. He would have adventures at home, school, and around his suburban neighborhood. Sometime later, Eddie became a misogynist. I don't really blame him considering he was raped and molested with his mother doing nothing to prevent this horrific crime. However, I do condemn the next part of his adulthood. After his anger consumed him further, he became a serial killer who mutilated women. It's without a doubt he became a serial killer because of his hatred toward his mother. Side note, I'm not saying being a misogynist is warranted. However, in this specific game instance, I can sympathize with why Eddie became one. After Waylon uploads his recordings on the internet, Eddie was briefly seen cutting into a captured victim. Eddie Gluskin's backstory hits pretty close to home for me. Two of my brothers were sadly sexually assaulted by their babysitter. If you were a victim of abuse or you know a person that's a victim of abuse, please seek the authorities immediately. There are many people that want to help you, so please don't hesitate. Andrew Andrew is one of the morphogenic engine scientists that are in charge of hands-on human experimentation. Hands-on meaning they are the ones that restrain the patients that are admitted. You encounter Andrew at the very beginning of the game. He's the one that gives you a nice long wet tongue lick. I played Outlast 1 in the whistleblower, but nothing compares to that tongue makeout session against Wayland's will. Anyway, Andrew quickly leaves after hearing from a coworker that Billy Hope reached lateral ascension. Lateral ascension is a term I'm not able to find in the scientific community. Andrew's whereabouts are completely unknown. Considering the whistleblower, a lot of scientists die right in front of us. It's not hard to imagine that he was murdered by a patient. Steve. Steve is another Murkoff employee that oversees the morphogenic engine experiments. 
He, in fact, is one of the higher-ranking scientists in the facility. It's obvious when you first encounter him because he gives you orders and threatens to give you a bad report for getting startled by Eddie Gleskin. His backstory is completely unknown, but I'd like to think of him as Andrew's twin brother. I say that because they look practically identical. A lot of the fan base think they are the same person, but in fact they are not. The reason they look identical is because Red Barrels was recycling assets for characters that didn't make a big appearance. His whereabouts are completely unknown, but considering he is a higher-ranking scientist, he might have utilized an escape route specifically for higher-ups. However, at the same time, he could have been murdered by a patient. I'm just saying this randomly, but it would be awesome if we could see these scientists in one of the future games when they were younger. That would be pretty cool. Dennis. Dennis is one of the many patients that wreaked havoc in the Overtaken Asylum. He has no backstory whatsoever, but it's confirmed that he has Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's a mental disorder characterized by the maintenance of at least two distinct and relatively enduring personality states. The disorder is accompanied by memory gaps beyond what would be explained by ordinary forgetfulness. He has four different personalities. They consist of two brothers, their father, and their grandfather. Sadly, these personalities don't have any official names. This reminds me of the movie Split. If you haven't watched the movie, make sure to check it out. Funny enough, the main character in this film also has a disorder, and coincidentally, his name is Dennis as well. Dennis has the responsibility to bring potential brides to Eddie Gleskin. It's unknown whether Dennis was killed by the Murkoff Tactical Division or if he escaped the facility. Personally, I believe he's still somewhere in the vocational block, forever trying to find people immaculate enough to be Eddie's loving bride. Lisa Park. Okay, when I say there's no information about this character, I literally mean there's no information about this character. No backstory information whatsoever. We don't know what she was doing as an adult before she married Waylon, but eventually Lisa had two kids, both boys. There was a document in the whistleblower from Jeremy Blair telling another Murkoff employee that, you may receive requests for information from Miss Lisa Park of Leadville, Colorado in the coming weeks concerning the resignation and hospitalization of her husband Waylon. If so, please forward them to my personal attention. Waylon Park, former consulting contract 8208, resigned due to previously undiagnosed mental illness. I personally visited Miss Lisa Park and her sons and broke the news to them, with the silver lining that Murkoff Psychiatric would be generously providing treatment. Miss Park had some less than charitable things to say about myself and the Murkoff Corporation. I assured her with that her power of authority, she could try to fight the doctor's diagnosis of her husband's illness. However, if it were discovered that he resigned under false pretenses, his insurance would be canceled and the family would be saddled with not insignificant health care debts. Hopefully she understood, but if she insists on making a nuisance of herself or tries to get around me, please let me know. This is one I want to take care of personally. Yours, Jeremy Blair. From what we know during the gameplay and from this document, if the priest hadn't shut off power to the facility, Waylon would have suffered prolonged morphogenic engine experimentation. Not only that, but if Lisa decided to take legal action against Murkoff, it's very clear she and her two sons would have been assassinated by the company. Security Guards. The security guards that protect Mount Massive Asylum are a form of private security Murkoff utilizes to keep the facility under control. Due to security personnel needing an extremely high security clearance to brandish firearms, guards have to use combat to defend themselves. Because of this rule, a lot of security guards died during the chaos. Tactical security personnel were of a higher ranking than the standard security guard. They wore black riot vests and helmets, matching cargo pants and combat boots, as well as goggles. The tactical team were usually called into action when a situation reached insuppressible status from normal security personnel. They brandished Colt M4 carbines and presumably other firearms. It's unknown how many security guards survived the massacre at Mount Massive. We see several security guards lock themselves in rooms or cower in fear. I guess it's possible they stayed in these rooms or in certain secure places until the tactical security arrived. But at the same time, who is to say a patient didn't find them hiding and break down the barrier that divided them? One other thing, since Jeremy Blair was in front of the asylum entrance, I wouldn't put it past him if he killed the surviving security personnel. After all, they were witnesses that became insane directly because of the horrific nightmares they experienced. Simon Peacock Simon Peacock is a mysterious character who appears at the very end of the Outlast Whistleblower. Simon was a former Murkoff Corporation test subject who was voluntarily experimented on as a rough draft of what would become the Wall Rider. I can only imagine voluntarily meaning forcibly initiated, just like Wayland Park. If this turns out to be the case, then it would make sense for Simon to help Wayland during this death-defying escape. He might have a soft spot for this incident specifically. It appears because of this experimentation done to Simon, he is capable of showing superhuman strength. Though not as powerful as the Wall Rider, he is capable of withstanding a barrage of gunfire, point blank. After Simon decided he didn't want to partake in these twisted experiments, he decided to go against Murkoff. Simon executed this by founding Viral Leaks and started working as an independent journalist. Since Simon was, and presumably still is, an independent journalist, he could have met Miles or could have been friends with him. However, there's no evidence to support this. Following Wayland's escape from Mount Massive Asylum, he contacts a man who's associated with an independent journalist organization. It's unknown how Wayland contacted them, but it might have been similar to how he contacted Miles Upshur. After going over the asylum footage and assuring the Park family their safety, Simon informs Wayland what kind of damage his video recordings can do to the Murkoff Corporation. Simon specifically says, You press that button. There's no going back, Mr. Park. There's enough hard evidence in that video file to make a world of shit for our friends at Murkoff. 
You got out of Mount Massive alive, and we've done everything in our power to cover your tracks. But our enemies are twitching and malicious corporate paranoiacs with resources you're too moral to imagine. You won't be the only target. Anyone you care about, your wife, your child, there'll be nothing to murk off but ways to hurt you. I need you to understand the bridge you're crossing here. You will do irrevocable damage to the company. You might even get close to something like justice. But once you click upload, your life is over. Everyone you love is fucked. But it's the right thing to do. Is hurting Murkoff worth that much to you? Wayland understands the risk and detriment he and his family will have to go through if he uploads his video evidence. With a slight bit of hesitation, Wayland releases all the videos he captured to viral leaks for the public to see. After Wayland uploads his video evidence and some time has passed, Simon is caught going near Miles Upshur's previous apartment by Paul Marion and Pauline Glick. Paul chases Simon down. After Paul catches up to Simon, a short discussion between the two begins. The conversation is about what Paul's intentions as a Murkoff employee are. After Paul gives a straight answer and Simon reflects on his own time with the company, Simon gives Paul coordinates. These coordinates are discovered to be the Temple Gate compound. This evidence is irrefutable proof that Outlast 2 takes place in Outlast 1's universe. I know we already knew that, but to get solid evidence like this confirms a possibility beyond what the game developers say. Not to mention it's almost expected that Simon Peacock was in contact with Blake Langerman. Blake most likely leaked these coordinates to Simon, however I can't say why. After this major piece of evidence was given to Paul, Pauline began to gun down Simon, fearing that he knew too much about Murkoff's ambitions. However, Simon was completely unaffected and began to fight both Paul and Pauline. During the fight, Simon's cloak was pulled off, revealing a ragged, corpse-like body. After a bit more fighting, Simon sprints away in the darkness, successfully escaping from the two agents. A while later, Simon and possibly Wayland kidnap Paul Marion's daughter. Paul himself is eventually kidnapped as well by an unknown party. Some time passes and Paula is interrogated by Simon on the whereabouts of Miles Upshur and William Hope. Paul explains that imprinting religion onto someone works just as effectively as the morphogenic engine torture capabilities are. It's unknown what transpires next, but we can assume Paul will explain how Miles and Billy died during the facility's meltdown. Angered by this, Simon will take more action against the Murkoff Corporation by possibly kidnapping Pauline as well. Simon's whereabouts are unknown, but it's speculated he is on his way to the Temple Gate compound, where he will find more evidence against Murkoff and possibly find Blake Langerman. Underground Lab During Whistleblower The Underground Laboratory is where we were first introduced to Wayland Park. He is located in a dark server room where he writes an email to Miles Upshur. In my opinion, this is the juiciest scene we have of the entire Whistleblower DLC. To explain, since we're in a room filled with hundreds of hard drives, we can theorize how much illegal experimentation data the Murkoff Corporation has obtained. First off, all that footage of morphogenic engine patients is being stored somewhere in the facility. I can't say for certain if it's on the hard drives. We see it during the opening, but it's a definite possibility. Let's not forget to mention all the footage that Murkoff captured during the past four years of Mount Massive Asylum's reopening. All that information is somewhere, and I wouldn't doubt if some of it is stored at the asylum. Secondly, imagine all those classified documents that are being stored digitally. We find a few of them scattered about during our escape. But what about the documents that have not been printed into physical copies? Thousands of patient files, hundreds of employee files, and let's not forget the files that have core Murkoff members' information. To be completely honest, Miles should have grabbed at least three of those hard drives from one of the server rooms. Usually large companies obtain hard drives composed of two terabytes or higher. If Miles had six terabytes of information, he could have completely destroyed the company. That especially goes for Wayland as well. When Wayland is finished writing and sending his email, he is called upon by Steve, the morphogenic engine overseer. When Wayland makes his way to the morphogenic engine, he overhears two conversations. The second convo is about one of the scientists going to a lake with his wife. The first one, though, is far more interesting. It's about Dr. Warnicke's work. The conversation goes like... I'm worried that the stress response is going to affect the capillaries. Of course. The therapy's relying on it. Hope maxed out at 190? Parts per million, yeah, but those are precursors to precursors. I'm worried about losing anti-apoptotics. 190 isn't bad. The doctor was predicting assembly by 150. We're not being given enough information to trust Renicky's predictions. He's been right so far. I just want to know we're inventing something other than shiny new cancers. This conversation doesn't seem like a lot of information when you take it at face value. However, the dialogue between the two scientists confirmed that there are doubts from these experiments. Or at least they're having doubts on how these experiments are being conducted. In any case, it does show a slight hint of morality among the lower ranking scientists. There are a few more conversations between scientists besides the four in the hallway. However, these dialogues only consist of extremely minimal back history of Eddie Gluskin. Such as, he was a rape victim at a young age and in something to do with reptile imagery. Long as the first two is guided dreams, classified as Childhood sexual with reptile imagery. 
Other than that and a lot of scientific jargon, there's no other meaningful conversations to listen in on. After all this eavesdropping, Waylon finally gets to his computer where he fixes the functional imaging interface. Once you're done fixing the code and get up, you have the option to walk toward a guard by a see-through door. Once you look through the transparent door, you may notice some glass spheres circling around the morphogenic engine. Everything looks normal, but once you realize one of the spheres is not filled with blood, you become curious. In the base Outlast game, once you finally reach the lab with Miles, you see the spheres. One of them has Billy Hope occupying it, but there's another one with just blood and presumably a corpse inside. This patient is unknown. It was most likely another random patient that was being experimented on, but I would like to imagine he was a key figure in some way. Hospital. Once Waylon wakes up from the beating two hours prior, Andrew slips him some tongue, but leaves due to being informed that Billy Hope achieved lateral ascension with Project Wallrider. The next part is a little foggy. We have no idea how long Waylon was in the morphogenic engine testing facility. He could have been there for hours or minutes, but it's completely unclear. Anywho, sometime during the experimentation, Waylon was released by Father Martin. He looks around and sees a copious amount of drugs right next to him. These drugs are a mystery, but assumably they aid the process of lucid dreaming. As a fun experiment, can somebody use Freecam to look at the pill bottles? I'm very curious to know what they are. When you encounter Frank Manera for the second time, you find a mysterious laboratory. When you explore the laboratory, you can see jars that have human body parts in them. I would say Frank put them there, however, the lids on the jars don't seem like they'd screw off in any conventional way at least. I don't understand why there would be body parts in random jars. It seems unnecessary, especially for the morphogenic engine experiments. This leads me to conclude other experiments that involve dismemberment have happened at Mount Massive Asylum, or this is what they used to feed the cannibals in the facility. Recreation Area In the recreation area, we find a document that reads the following. Kurt, we've got another one, and I'm not sure you're going to be able to check it off as psychopathic proximity disorder. Security guard all the way up in the admin block is our latest non-patient employee to start seeing Vernicke's fairy tales. He was never directly exposed to the engine, never even made it below level one in the building. It would be an enormous breach of protocol and security if doctors were speaking of the wall rider within hearing of a contracted security guard, and seems vanishingly improbable that he would stumble onto such an obscure mythological story on his own. It's too similar to the Dr. Samuel case, or the others before him. It's one thing for formerly sane medical personnel to fall under the delusions of their patients. It's another thing entirely for those beliefs to be, I don't know, airborne? We need to talk in person. Billings. From this document, it seems like before the wall rider was even fully manifested, staff of the facility were seeing some type of paranormal entity. I highly doubt the security guard saw a proto wall rider. The only type of prior manifestation before Billy was in 1938 when Rudolf Wernicke details a brief manifestation of the swarm. In my opinion, the only reasonable explanation is that the security guard saw a real paranormal entity. Mount Massive Asylum has held terribly gruesome experiments for almost a combined total of eight years. Established in 1967 and closed in 1971. Reopened in 2009 and present day in the game 2013. I couldn't possibly imagine the amount of souls trapped in the facility. Another oddity in the recreational area is from an unnamed variant. When you approach him, he starts to speak. This is what he says. Don't trust them. They'll tell you it's science, but it's not. They were waiting for us in this place. Billy understood. They've always been here. Like I said in the first iceberg, these variants were once people. What happened to them physically and psychologically is saddening to witness. From the dialogue the variant speaks, it appears he personally knew Billy Hope, or at least has been in physical contact with him at some point. And yes, I know this is a repeated dialogue, but I'm still going to stick with my speculation. Prison When we enter the prison section of the asylum, we make our way to the shortwave radio mentioned earlier. Wayland tunes into the Leadville Police Department dispatcher, but before he's able to speak, Jeremy Blair destroys the radio with a baton. He then begins to strangle Wayland with said baton. I'm curious to know how the police dispatcher did not hear Jeremy's attempted strangulation and voice. There's a possibility that Wayland wasn't pressing the button on the transmitter. However, it doesn't appear there were any side buttons on the device. There were three buttons on the front of the transmitter, but generally to talk to somebody on a shortwave radio, there has to be a button on the side. With this information in mind, there was a distinct possibility the dispatcher heard the confrontation but chose not to send police. I can't explain why he wouldn't, but maybe it's because the jammer surrounding Mount Massive was interfering with the signal tracking. Either that or the dispatcher couldn't hear anything because Red Barrels forgot to add the button to the transmitter. Well, that's just fucking great. Something I'd like to mention is why do all CCTV monitors have the exact same surveillance footage? One possibility is that Murkoff might have lost a large number of operational security cameras during a breakout. Perhaps variants destroyed the equipment during their rampage, or at least ripped out the wiring in the walls. They wouldn't have done this for tactical reasons, but out of sheer paranoia of being watched. Drying Ground The drying ground section is one of the less informative areas Wayland passes through. Immediately after we enter the drying ground stage, you have the option to explore a utility shed. If you do, you'll find the document that reads, Above the D's, below the navel, sliced and sewn on Gluskin's table. To make a place to push inside, the groom will make himself a bride. This message repeats itself six times. I could only assume it alludes to Gluskin's pursuit of Wayland. After this message has been read, you make your way to some blocked double doors. Suddenly, a random variant bangs on the door and laughs psychotically. 
You could have been one of Gluskin's followers, but we won't know for sure. This variant is unknown and will most likely forever be a mystery. There are two other incidents that happened during the drying ground section, but I will discuss them further down the iceberg. Vocational Block When falling into the vocational block, you're treated to a very lengthy maze in the attic. During your exploration of this floor, you come across a man that seems to stare at you from a distance. As you approach the man, you realize he's hanging from a noose connected to the rafters. When you approach the corpse, it becomes very apparent that this was a Murkoff employee. The man was wearing a white collared shirt and sleek black pants. How he got there is unknown, but presumably Dennis killed the man and then hung him from the ceiling. The position he filled in Murkoff's ranks are unclear, but judging from the way he was dressed, I can only assume he was a higher up just like Jeremy Blair. Obviously not as high, but definitely in the top tier. After encountering the man, you continue through the maze of the attic. Practically immediately after, you encounter a variant that gives you a warning about Gluskin. If they, if they catch us, they'll give us to him. The man downstairs. The man. Very bad. Very, very bad. God! Oh, God! It's only been a short while, but Gluskin has already made everyone in his vicinity terrified of him. Either that or before the asylum outbreak, he was already feared by the other variants. Anyway, the reason I bring up this random variant is because when Gluskin has Waylon on the cutting board, a random variant punches Gluskin, letting him escape. The variant that punched Gluskin might very well be the same variant we meet in the attic. There's no evidence for this, but I'd like to think he came back to save Waylon. After the attempted rescue, the variant runs off quickly, but is pursued by Gluskin. We don't know what happens to him, but we can only assume the worst. There is one more thing I want to talk about, but I will have to discuss it further down the iceberg. The Exit The final moments in the asylum have the least amount of information. I can only find two topics to talk about. The first one is when Wayland makes his way to the final moments of the game. He has the option to go down to the basement. If you don't remember, Miles went down to the basement to turn the power back on. If you choose to try and go down, you'll be met with the door boarded up. We don't know for sure who boarded up the basement, but we can only assume it was one of the tactical division members. The second topic will be discussed further down the iceberg. Duplicated Rigs Duplicated rigs are something in video games that can be explained with ease from the gaming community. Similar to repeating animations, duplicates are used to save money and time at the expense of production value. However, just like the last iceberg I made, this can be explained with the Murkoff Corporation's inhumane activity. But before I talk about Murkoff, let me add some context to back up my explanation of duplication. In 1997, a female domestic sheep named Dolly was cloned for the world to see. Geniuses Keith Campbell, Ian Wilma, and colleagues at the Roslyn Institute decided to play God by using a process called nuclear transfer. This in turn created the cloned animal and sparked numerous controversies as one may predict. Ideas spanning from bringing back extinct species, cloning animals with human diseases for experimentation, and even creating humans just to dissect them in science class were all plausibilities. Everyone in 1997 was conflicted in some way or another, but something was for certain. The world was changing in ways unforeseen by everyday people. I bring up Dolly because there's no doubt in my mind that Murkoff would recreate the technology required for cloning. Judging from the nefarious actions we've seen already, they would create their own brand of humans to play with. I'm inclined to believe that. From test subjects to mercenaries, cloning humans would be in their best interest. If you're not convinced of this possibility, let me just remind you of something. They bought a 10-year-old child, physically and mentally tortured him for 13 years, and hooked him up to a machine that was completely experimental. This boy's name was William Billy Hope. If you still don't believe this is a possibility, you're too moral for the Outlast universe. No communication from scientists. During the beginning of the whistleblower, you encounter several scientists that are having conversations primarily about Eddie Gluskin. When you approach them, they don't acknowledge you. Even if you run into them, they have no dialogue to exchange. Obviously, this can be contributed to Red Barrel's not programming these particular animations for the character models. However, if we look at this from an in-game perspective, it's quite possible the higher-ranking scientists Wayland runs into were ordered not to communicate with him by Jeremy Blair. Considering Jeremy already knew he was leaking information, he probably wanted to see if Wayland was working alone or with an accomplice. Remember, we have no idea who the laptop owner was. All we know is it was stolen by Wayland. Even if it was borrowed, the person that owned it probably wouldn't want to get caught, but at the same time, they would want their equipment back. Ergo, they probably would ask for it at some point later. Perhaps this was something Jeremy was looking for, an exchange between the two of some sort. When Wayland walks into the morphogenic engine room, Steve is the only person to talk to him. Would it be a stretch to say he was ordered to specifically get Wayland to go to the lab as a way for Jeremy to access the laptop? I think not. It makes a lot of sense for this theoretical plan. You might be asking yourself, why didn't Jeremy just order the guards to forcibly restrain Wayland as he was walking to or from the morphogenic engine? It's because he wouldn't want to make a scene in front of the other scientists. As he probably would put it, it's bad for morale. Even though I hate him, this would have been an extremely smart move on Jeremy's part. Flying Guard When you're called to the morphogenic engine room, you're ordered to get the functioning imaging interface talking to the arterial spin labeling. If you're like me and have no idea what this means, it's a magnetic resonance imaging technique used to quantify cerebral blood perfusions by labeling blood water as it flows through the brain. 
Anyway, as Wayland starts to work, Eddie Gluskin is hauled into the perimeter of the morphogenic engine. He briefly escapes from the tactical division and slams his hands on the glass, begging to be saved. If you look behind Eddie during this moment, you can clearly see a guard stopping their pursuit, but immediately after starts flying to restrain him. Either this guard has a superhuman ability or this was a massive oversight on Red Barrel's part. Without saying, I think the latter is true. How did the Murkoff Technical Division enter the underground lab? When the tactical division arrived at the asylum for the second time, they somehow entered the underground laboratory. You might say they used the elevator. However, if we look back at the scene where we first entered the lab, it's clear the elevator stopped working. Perhaps the mercenaries found another way in through a secret opening point or an emergency exit. If so, we've never seen the secret entrance during the gameplay. Or did we? Do you remember my overview of the exit? I mentioned that one of the tactical division officers might have boarded up the basement entrance. What if a squad of soldiers knew about a secret passage that led to the lab from there? It might be a long shot, but that would explain why the doors were boarded up. They would have done this so no other variants could get in and attack them from behind. When they retrieved Wernicke and silenced any witnesses, they would radio in for one of the other officers to remove the board panels. But as we know, the wall rider killed the entire squad when they encountered Miles. I'd like to think this theory has a good possibility of being true, but if you have any other ideas on how the tactical division got into the underground lab, don't hesitate to share. Secret document. If you install a mod menu for Outlast, you will be able to access a secret document that's never actually encountered in the regular game. When you start Whistleblower, walk until you see the main entrance of the morphogenic engine room. There you will need to enable Super Jump to jump over the large metal doors. When you land, you will end up on a long blue pipeline. You will have to jump again to enter the morphogenic engine room. Sometimes you will fall out of the map, but all you have to do is repeat the process until you're able to land in the room. Once you're in, approach the two scientists that are next to the main control desk. Here you will find the unseen document. It reads, Question mark INT question mark OL narrative DLC dot documents dot lab underscore doc underscore core room question mark. I have no idea what this means, but I can only assume it's game code. My question is, why does this document even exist if it's something we never encounter? I'd assume this random string of gibberish is something similar to a character model doing a T-pose, a placeholder until its main purpose commences. Perhaps this document was something we could have found, but the developers decided to exclude it for unknown reasons. Unless we ask the developers, we'll never know the secret, and even if we do ask, they may have forgotten what the document role was. If you want to try out this glitch for yourself, I recommend checking out DG Beck's video on how to install the mod. However, it only works for the PC version of the game. If you feel more comfortable talking with him in person, make sure to join my Discord so you can chat with him. Branch Timeline there's a way to beat Whistleblower without ever encountering Jeremy Blair at the end. However, you have to perform a glitch to get out of the asylum prematurely. Listen carefully, these instructions will have to be done with precision and a lot of practice. Don't feel discouraged if you're not able to execute the glitch on your first time. When you're at the end of the game, you wind up in the same place Miles enters the asylum. Walk halfway down the hallway and turn into the conference room on your right. Once you're in the room, shut the door and then open it slowly. Immediately jump backward, but once you land on the ground, jump forward. If performed correctly, you will teleport on top of the door. All you have to do now is crouch walk on the room walls until you get to the opposite side. Once there, jump into the wall and pause the game. Make sure to do this quickly. Unpause the game after 4 seconds and walk forward. Congratulations, you're officially outside the asylum without encountering Jeremy Blair. If you need more detail, a video card will pop up now. This is where the branch timeline hypothesis comes in. When you're outside, you have the option to go to the main doors of the asylum. If you decide to go there, you will notice something strange. Jeremy has vanished from his spot. I can only speculate, but perhaps he left the facility to go to a hospital or some type of medical facility. Don't forget, he stabbed himself in the abdomen just so he could trick and kill any survivors that tried to leave. After a while, he must have known that he needed medical attention for the amount of blood that was lost. You and Waylon can now hop in Miles' Jeep and drive away without ever getting stabbed. The most unnerving part of this entire reveal has to be the fact Jeremy is still alive and working for Murkoff. Once he catches wind of Waylon's escape, he would most likely hunt him down and kill him himself. Sadly, there's a plot hole in this theory. When you're at the main doors, you can decide to walk in the building. If you do, Jeremy's character model appears out of thin air and will stab Waylon. Logically, this just means Red Barrels needs to patch the game and fix this bug. If we look at this from a fan theory perspective, it makes complete sense to assume Jeremy left the asylum to seek medical attention. What are your opinions on this theory? Do you think it's possible? Make sure to leave a comment and tell me what you think. Outlast Wheelchair to Heaven the earliest known footage of anyone executing the Wheelchair to Heaven glitch was in 2015 by a YouTuber named Albino Hat. It's unknown if he was the first person to discover the technique, but ever since the discovery, his popularity has exploded. The glitch became so popular, in fact, it created a new speedrunning category called the Wheelchair to Heaven Percent Speedrun. If you're interested in trying to attempt the glitch, here are the instructions. Go to the dumbwaiter where Richard Traeger pretends to rescue you. When you're able to, open the cage door and immediately exit to the main menu. Once there, reload your checkpoint and play the game as normal until you free yourself from the wheelchair Traeger puts you in. You will have to leave the room you're in and perform a few door glitches until you get back to the dumbwaiter again. This time when you try to open the cage door, Miles' character model will perform the animation of getting in a wheelchair. You will then slowly float up diagonally and become stuck in midair. There's no way to get unstuck, unless you reopen a previous save point. 
If you would like an uncut video on how to perform the glitch, a video card will pop up now. The world record holder for this speedrun is Phallix. He's been on the leaderboard since June 8, 2020. I hope this part of the video encourages the viewer to steal the world record and become the number one speedrunner for this category. Good luck. Chris Walker versus Hospital Bed. I love Outlast and the DLC, but seriously, the AI can sometimes be incredibly bad. Let's use Chris Walker for example. After you try to contact the police in the prison ward, Chris chases you until you slip through a vertical bed frame. First of all, it's hard to believe that you can escape from him so easily by just squeezing through an improvised blockade. From what we've witnessed, Chris could easily bulldoze through something like that. However, let's give him the benefit of the doubt and say he can't. He would still be able to move the furniture out of the way so he could continue the hunt. A regular person could do that, so why can't a man that can literally rip someone's head off not move a little bit of furniture? It doesn't make sense. Anyway, when you escape from Chris for the first time, you encounter Father Martin. It just so happens there's a big hole right next to him, so you jump down it. You wander around for a bit, eventually going into a hallway where Chris begins his pursuit again. Once you make it to the end of the hallway, you have the option to jump out of a window. But if you decide to turn around, you'll notice Chris has stopped. Funnily enough, the programmers didn't code him to jump over objects during this chase scene in particular, so all you see is his glare from behind a hospital bed. Let's say Chris attacks you if you get too close to him. That wouldn't be bad at all. In fact, that would make a lot of sense. Sadly, no matter how close you get to him, he won't attack you. If you notice this bug during your gameplay, it would really take you out of the horror experience. The Note there's a moment in the base Outlast game when you're chased by a variant with a baton through a hallway. This occurs when you leave the sewers and enter the mail ward. The chase scene isn't out of the ordinary, it's pretty much standard and routine. I'd imagine after this guy runs after you, you'd probably leave the location and progress through the game as usual. However, if you decide to take a hit from the variant, he will leave you alone and run off. Following him will eventually lead you to a dead end where you'll be forced to turn around, but when you do, you'll see another variant on the ground. He'll be in a straitjacket and curled up on the floor with a note beside him. This note is the most confusing piece of paper we see during the game. If we zoom in on the message, we will see the readable English word, elements. There are some other words in different languages, such as suhate, poor, chosis, and deny. These words translate into mouth, for, cheerful, and given. The names of the languages are Estonian, Portuguese, French, and Slovenian. Now, I could be wrong, considering using Google Translate is notorious for being one of the worst foreign language translators out there. Imagine that. But since the note isn't pure gibberish, this motivates me to hypothesize that the contents has a hidden meaning behind several different language barriers. No one on my Discord server, including myself, has been able to completely decode the message. If you have any ideas on what it says, I would love to hear them. Hopefully together we can crack the code and understand this mysteriously well-hidden Easter egg. Water Monster. There are two supposed interactions with a water monster in both Outlast and its DLC. The game itself adamantly reassures us that everything in Mount Massive is completely explainable through scientific means. However, the more I research, the more I find evidence of unexplainable and perhaps paranormal events that take place at the estate. First, a document from Jay Billings hinting at paranormal activity, and now finding evidence of potential cryptids hiding in Murkoff's sewer system. I'm starting to think there are more than just escaped psych ward patients that are lurking around the asylum. The first auditory interaction takes place when you and Miles explore the underground sewer system. You reach a certain part where you have to crawl through an inlet-outlet sewer hole. When you reach the other side, you'll continue through the main sewer system. As you're exploring, a weird sound can be heard in the distance. This could be air escaping from pipes, but when you walk further down, you'll hear something moving in the water. If there were enemies around us, this noise would be explainable. However, since there isn't any variance around, we can merely speculate the cause. The second interaction is when you enter the drying ground after you shut off the electric fence blocking your path. There's a little pond filled with sewage you have to crawl through to enter the vocational block. As you're midway through, the sound of a roar followed by a huge splash in the water appears in front of you. There's no possible way a variant or an object fell into the water. If there had, it would have been completely visible to the eye. If there was a water monster in the lake and you ran into it at some point, I would have to acknowledge that it would attack you, but it doesn't. That in itself pokes a hole through this theory. Another explanation could be Red Barrel's admiration for amnesia. As all amnesia fans can recall, there's a water monster that appears six times in the game, one of the locations being the archive tunnels. The sewer system in Outlast and the archive tunnels have a very similar style to them. It wouldn't be impossible the splashes we encounter was inspired from the water monster in Amnesia. Just another inspired Easter egg or a cryptid living in the asylum sewer system. Only Red Barrels would know for sure. What happened to Wayland's wife? Lisa Park as well as her two sons have completely vanished from the public and the government. The last time her whereabouts were solidified was when Wayland burned down his house and left the state with his family. I can only imagine Lisa and her kids are living somewhere in the wilderness or in a city with different identification. One thing's for certain, if we come back to Wayland's storyline, Murkoff will capture and torture her for information about her husband. When did the asylum lose control? We have no idea when the asylum lost control. 
Obviously, everything spiraled into chaos before Miles entered the building. The only type of time matching we can do is when Father Martin shuts off the power and when Waylon is released from morphogenic engine experimentation. These two instances are the only solid leads we have for any type of theoretical timeline. We need something further back to explain how the asylum went under. If we look at the Mount Massive Asylum incident as a whole, there may possibly be evidence of when the asylum lost control. Let's start off with a recap before Miles shows up at the asylum. When Billy Hope took control of the wall rider, he used the entity to slaughter Murkoff personnel and patients within the facility. In the ensuing chaos, many variants escaped and they too began wreaking homicidal havoc in their extremely unstable states of mind. The security forces desperately tried to quell the attacks and stop the patients, but ultimately failed, losing the facility to the inmates as the emergency evacuation was put into action. Following their initial failure, Murkoff dispatched a group of private military contractors who arrived in the midst of chaos with several MRAP trucks and riot gear, one of them being Stevenson. Despite being well armed, the teams were soon slaughtered by the variants and the wall rider. Many of the escape patients started to freely roam the asylum with no set purpose. Some of them took on a sort of religion and started to worship the wall rider, thinking that it was God. These variants became followers of Father Martin, who was attempting to release the wall rider into the world. Chris Walker, however, came over and fucked the wall rider, and they realized it was all bullshit. That's what it says. No, it doesn't. Hurry up. <laughs> Chris Walker, another escape variant, was trying to prevent this from happening. Many variants enacted their murderous revenge against the Murkoff personnel, whilst other patients participated in the chaos. This all happens within the span of a few hours. We know Miles arrives at the asylum at 9.45 p.m., and I've already established that Wayland sends his email two hours before the facility goes to shit. If you would like to hear my explanation for these factors, check out the first iceberg. Let's take 9.45 p.m. and rewind two hours from it. If I'm correct, the asylum as well as Billy Hope lose control at 7.45 p.m. in the game. This is just my conclusion after theorizing with the evidence I've gathered. I could be wrong and would love to hear your theories on when the asylum outbreak begins. What happened to the inmates that are MIA? The truth is we have no idea what happened to the patients after we came in contact with them. The twins are missing, Frank Manera is missing, Dennis is missing, every single variant we didn't see die with our own eyes are assumably in unknown locations. That's not even mentioning the scientists and guards we see alive during the game. Where did they go? We do know some of them made their way to the administration block for evacuation, but there were bound to be some that weren't able to make it in time. It's safe to say Murkoff's tactical division killed a lot of patients and staff during the cleanup operation. Presumably, it does look like every single variant was killed by tactical. However, since 14 to 15 hours passed since the breach occurred, it's not hard to believe some patients escaped the asylum and are now wandering around the mountains of Leadville, Colorado. Is Wayland Korean? There's been a theory going around Reddit that explains how Wayland Park might be Korean. To some, this hypothesis doesn't seem realistic, or at the very least seems like a long shot. However, after doing extensive research on the topic, I found some evidence to back up the claim. The first piece of evidence is Wayland's surname. According to Mom Junction, the last name Park is one of the top 100 popular last names in Korea. To be specific, the 82nd most popular. The usage of the surname could very well be a creative hint from Red Barrels telling us the character's ethnicity without ever showing us his face or identity report records. Similarly, another Canadian-based gaming studio did the exact same thing with their Korean character. Does anyone remember Jake Park from Dead by Daylight? Now, I'm not saying every Canadian gaming studio has a Korean character with the last name Park, but we should take into account it has happened before. It's not in the realm of impossibility. The second piece of evidence comes from the Murkoff account, part four. On page three, we follow Pauline Glick and Paul Marion. They both are trying to find Waylon, including anyone that might know him, such as his family. When they arrive at his house, they find it completely burned down with no signs of life. After exploring the property for a little bit, Paul discovers a picture of Waylon, his wife and his two kids. If we look closely at the picture Paul is holding, Waylon looks like he could be of Korean descent. However, it very well could be possible the art style Red Barrels decided to go with only makes him look Korean instead of him actually being Korean. What is your opinion on the theory? Do you think Waylon is Korean or is it just the art style that makes him appear so? I guess only Red Barrels would know the true answer. One thing I'd like to mention is, on the official Outlast wiki page, Waylon's hair color is claimed to be blonde, but if we look at the Murkoff account, his hair color is clearly blackish brown. Just a small little detail I noticed while investigating. No black people. Another discussion on Reddit is, how come there's no black patients or staff in Mount Massive Asylum? One of the commenters by the name of Dr. Tomy posted a comment explaining why he thinks there are no black people in the game. When designing characters, the developers make them light-skinned at first, since it's easy to examine and adjust their features. Making them dark-skinned is achieved by giving them appropriate textures afterwards. I never noticed her care. I'm white too, but now that you pointed it out, they definitely could have added some characters. For the sake of realism, at least. I personally have no idea how video game character models are made, so I can't add or subtract what this guy is saying. However, after doing a bit of digging online, I found out female characters are harder to animate in video games, at least according to Ubisoft. Sadly, I couldn't find any specific articles or quotes discussing if black people are harder to animate specifically because of the darker skin tone. 
Perhaps it really is harder to animate black people in video games. If that's the case, considering Red Barrels had a shoestring budget for Outlast, it wouldn't surprise me if they cut different darker skinned ethnicities for the sake of their budget and or time restrictions. However, like I said, I have no idea if animating darker skinned character models is harder than animating lighter skinned character models. It just isn't in my field of work to know for certain. If anyone is skilled at creating video games, please confirm whether or not it's more difficult. For your information, the Murkoff account does have black people in it, so it's not like Red Barrels is pro-exclusion of certain ethnic groups. Please do not mix up this conversation and take it out of context. Who was on the intercom? After your first encounter with Chris Walker in the prison ward, you will hear a feminine sounding voice over the intercom. If this is a woman, it could add to the theory that there are still female doctors and patients at the asylum. The person on speaker makes it clear that every Murkoff staff member needs to evacuate immediately. Attention Murkoff personnel, an emergency evacuation is in process. Please proceed immediately to the administrative block. We have no idea who this person is, however I have a theory on who it might be. If we listen to the voice carefully it does sound feminine to a certain extent. If we think back to the beginning of Whistleblower, there was one other Murkoff employee we meet that had a similarly pitched voice. Let me give you a hint about this mysterious stranger. They mentioned that Billy Hope had reached a lateral ascension to their higher up. The man then told the unnamed assistant to follow him to the main morphogenic engine room. Is this ringing a bell yet? I hypothesize the person over this intercom is Andrew's assistant. This person was never named, but had a very distinct voice to the character, a voice that shares an uncanny similarity to the person over the intercom. Let me know if you disagree with this theory. I would love to hear your thoughts on who you think this might be. Suicide After you walk through the sewage-filled pond in the drying ground area, you witness somebody jumping off of the water tower, presumably committing suicide to escape the horrors of Mount Massive. During the outbreak of variants, 14 hours pass, and in that amount of time, there must have been an unfathomable amount of suicides taking place. Even Father Martin, the self-proclaimed wall rider's strong-willed servant, committed sacrificial suicide to escape the asylum and go to a heaven-like place, a truly melancholy and hellish buildup of circumstances. If you yourself have the urge to commit suicide, please reconsider and seek help. You may not know it, but there are people that love you and people that want to help you. Don't lose sight of your own value. Burn the Building, Kill Us, Kill Us document. The Burn the Building document is a message as found by one of the entrances to the asylum. The document reads, Kill Us, Burn the Building, Worse Than Death Here, Kill Us, Kill Us. It's unknown who wrote the message, but I theorize it could have been related to the variant that attempted to burn the building down in the base game. He appears unique compared to the other variants with the exception of the burned right side of his face. Unlike other patients, he has kept his sanity for the most part, being able to talk to Miles in a calm, reasonable way. However, because of the mutilating experimentation done to him, he's prepared to burn down the asylum, including himself and anyone who's in it. I had to burn it. All of it. Murkoff took so much from us. Used us. Turned us into these things because nobody cares about a few forgotten lunatics. So let it burn. Burn the whole goddamn thing down. Get out. What do you think? Could this be the same person? What does Waylon look like? After you escape Chris Walker and go to the A block side of the asylum, you'll bump into two guards. One of them says, Oh God, one of them is coming. It's not even human anymore. Block it. Shut it in. This was a very haunting remark about Waylon. If the guards saw him and they both were this panicked from the sheer sight of his face, we can only imagine the different types of induced mutations the morphogenic engine plastered on Waylon. Sadly, since we never see his face in the game, this theory cannot be confirmed unless Red Barrels themselves corroborate this prediction as true. Whatever the theorizing, these guards saw something we didn't, and from their expressions alone I'm inclined to believe Waylon's body has become a variation of its old self. How did Eddie escape from the morphogenic engine? When we first see Eddie Gleskin, he's being forcibly shoved into one of the morphogenic engine spheres. As a desperate last attempt, he breaks free from the scientist restraining him and runs to Waylon, begging to be saved by him. Sadly, all we can do is witness as he's dragged back to the experiment. Once the scientists hook him up inside the sphere, Waylon sets up the live video feed of Eddie as he's reveling in pain. Disfiguring marks start to appear on his face and body. Waylon is then asked to leave the morphogenic engine room, and the events of Whistleblower take place. The damage done to Eddie's person during the testing was an unwanted negative reaction from the machine. 
If we can recall from earlier, we overhear a pair of scientists discussing the stress response affecting the capillaries in a patient. They're not specific, but if we assume they're talking about Eddie, that would explain the wounds appearing on his face and body. During the two-hour gap, the scientists must have removed Eddie from the sphere in case he were to die from the machine's effects. He then was swapped with Billy and put back into the special holding cell for Project Wall Rider patients. Eventually, when Billy took full control of the Wall Rider, he must have destroyed the main holding cell doors, and as a consequence, released Eddie into the asylum. I think with the given evidence, this is more of a fact instead of a hypothesis. However, since it has not been confirmed, perhaps he escaped a different way. Maybe he was released by a staff member, or when they were taking him out of the sphere, he could have killed some scientists and ran away. The question remains unanswered, and that's why I would like to hear your theories on how Eddie escaped from the morphogenic engine room. What's behind the asylum? As you enter the drying grounds and go up the water tower, you'll see a back perspective of the asylum's main entrance. I've always wondered if we were able to access the front of the building before whistleblower's ending, and thanks to DG Beck, we will finally know the answer. As we fly over to the front of the asylum, we see it disappear. This was disappointing, but I guess the developers really had to cut all the corners they were able to, which is understandable considering their budget. I just wish there were more Easter eggs or at least references in the first Outlast game. But a man can dream. A man can dream. I do have a bonus clip to show you guys. Before we enter the drying ground, we can clip through one of the asylum's entrances and see Eddie Gluskin wandering the halls. I thought this was a pretty neat hidden occurrence DG Beck found in the game, and I'm glad he did so I could share it with all you guys. Why did Eddie leave the key? When we escape Eddie for the first time, we have to retrieve a key and unlock the door that leads to the mail ward. Once we arrive at a makeshift wedding hall, we find the key in the hand of a dead variant. Eddie then finds us and begins chasing us down. One perplexing thing about this scene is that, why would Eddie put the key in a very noticeable spot for us to take? It's something that hasn't made sense to me for a very long amount of time, but after thinking about Eddie's personality for a bit, I think I've come to a conclusion. What if he wanted you to find the key? After we escaped from him the first time, I think he came up with a plan so he could dispose of us without any more setbacks. Eddie is definitely one of the few intelligent variants that wandered the asylum. In fact, I would say he's even more clever than most of the characters we run into. It's not hard to imagine that he placed the key in a dead variant's hand so he could lure us into a trap and finally finish us off. I definitely think this presumed plan is something he would have come up with to catch Waylon. What's inside the burning church? When Waylon escapes from Gluskin and enters the male ward, he reaches a room that leads to the site of the burning chapel from the base game. For the longest time, I've wondered what was inside of it. Now obviously I know if we put two and two together, we can come to the conclusion that Father Martin is still nailed to the crucifix, with his followers still beside him. However, I wanted to know for sure. Maybe there was an Easter egg inside the building that no one has discovered yet. Or perhaps a rough outline of Father Martin still on the cross. But sadly I found out the truth of what it was in the building. As you can see here, when we free cam to the chapel, there isn't a texture for the building wall, or even an opposing side. It's completely empty, except for the flames on top. Even though figuring out this mystery was a bit anticlimactic, I'm glad I was able to find the answer to what was behind the chapel. Patients 14306-8, 14279-1, 14, and 14868-1. When you're evading Murkoff's tactical division in the DLC, you might stumble across a document from Helen Granite, an employee of Murkoff Corporation's legal mitigation department. The document reads, Dear Sirs, the groundwork has been laid to ensure an eventful egress for Rudolf Wernicke from structural and financial systems at Mount Massive. His advanced age should alleviate any suspicions among contractors and employees, among whom he has been cheerfully nicknamed the Crypt Keeper. And legally speaking, he died years ago. I understand patients 14306-8, 14279-1, and 14868-1 have already been scheduled for transit. We're all terribly excited at the obvious profit potential of the new project. My researchers have combed through Wernicke's files and found no mention of the three lucid dreamers. I think we can safely assume Wernicke was sufficiently distracted by the partial success of patient Billy Hope, along with his own infirmity, to be ignorant of the real discovery at hand. Even minimal exploitation of these resources is hard to overestimate. I only hope the new facility is sufficiently shielded to allow female staff so I can see what comes with my own eyes. Respectfully, Helen Granite. One of the many striking observations I made while reading this document was the mentioning of patients 14306-8, 14279-1, and 14868-1. I've never heard of these patients before, and I don't think we've ever come in contact with them. At first, I thought these test subjects were Billy Hope, Eddie Gluskin, and that mysterious dead variant we found in one of the morphogenic engine spheres. However, I don't think that's the case anymore, and here's why. Whenever the scientists bring in a new subject for the morphogenic engine, they mention them by their surname or first name. For example, when Steve was complaining that Waylon wasn't present to fix the ASL, he says, They got Gluskin out of his cell. If Helen exclusively mentions the three morphogenic engine test subjects by their psych ward numbers, then why would Mount Massive staff call the patients by their actual names? That in itself wouldn't make sense because it would be confusing to mention the same patient in two different ways. It's counterintuitive. 
If she mentioned the patient number so no one could find out their real names, that still wouldn't make any sense because the document would have been exclusively read by Mount Massive executives. She's also a part of the Murkoff Corporation's legal mitigation department. It's not like anyone would be looking over her shoulder for information, and even if someone did, they would have to enter her office to do so. Not to mention the main Murkoff headquarters is unquestionably secure as fuck. You put fucking your fucking fucking script, fuck, <laughs> fuck, fucker, re. Fuck is a very dynamic word. If you still don't believe me, then how come she brings up Billy Hope's name like he's a separate entity from the numbered patients? Another thing I would like to bring up, Helen mentions that the numbered patients have been scheduled for transit for a new project. This couldn't possibly be a project wall rider considering Billy, Eddie, and that other guy were already at Mount Massive with a morphogenic engine. She also seems to detest Fernicky, calling him an infirm man ignorant of the real discovery at hand. What is this new discovery? Something that is more urgent and perhaps more powerful than the wall rider is a seriously haunting thought. Just imagine everything the wall rider was capable of and Murkoff looking down on it like some type of side project. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We can't possibly fathom the corruption and heinousness the Murkoff Corporation is capable of. By doing this much research, it appears to be unceasing. I just want to tell all of you guys, how in the hell am I the first person to be talking about all these extremely open discoveries? Like, come on, even the leaderboard with their 107 facts have nothing on this kind of research. I mean, Jesus Christ, even in this video, there are so many things I had to cut out because this video would have been way too goddamn long. I want everybody that watches this video to make more Outlast content, because there's definitely not a shortage. Outlast has one of the most underrepresented stories out there. Not to mention, its presence on YouTube is minuscule at best. Now don't confuse what I'm saying, Outlast definitely has a huge fan base. It's just that no one talks about the lore or the different theories that have been passed around. I hope this video encourages viewers to cross-examine the hidden content of not just the game, but the entire story Red Barrels is trying to tell. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I just want to make this clear, this channel isn't just about making Outlast videos. I will post other theories I have on different franchises. If anyone has any recommendations for the next Iceberg video I do, I'm all ears. Make sure to subscribe and leave a like, it truly does help. I appreciate all of you and I'll catch you in the next video.
Hey, using actions. What's going on, man? I mean, like, ever since the uh, Outlast Iceberg I did, I just realized there's so much lore and shit that I'm probably not going to be able to do myself. Do you want to do a collaboration on the Outlast 2 Iceberg? Oh, absolutely.